The following program is sponsored by CBN. Today, I've always loved story. At home with a beloved writer. I was making up stories when I was four years old. How Debbie Maycumber became a best-selling author. When you want something so badly, you have to be willing to face rejection. Then, their mom had holes in her brain. We just gradually became more and more concerned. And doctors said there was no hope. The best thing you can do is pray she dies quickly. Now watch her make an incredible recovery on today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to this edition of the 700 Club. We've got a shocking story for you. The United States government is breeding mouse humans with your taxpayer money. You will not believe it, but that's coming up on this program. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu strikes out no new government for Israel. And how will his rival Benny Gantz respond? And what will happen in the fight against terrorism if Gantz draws support from Arab parties? Our Chris Mitchell brings us the critical details from Jerusalem. Netanyahu returned the mandate to form a government shortly after sundown at the end of the Jewish High Holy Days. Since I received the mandate, I've worked tirelessly both in public and behind the scenes to establish a broad national unity government. That's what the people want. It's also what Israel needs in response to the security challenges that increase by day and by the hour. Netanyahu released a video explaining that he had repeatedly approached blue and white leader Benny Gantz, his partner Yair Lapid, and Israeli Betenu leader Avigdor Lieberman. Gantz, Lapid, and Lieberman only talk about unity. In practice, they do the complete opposite. They encourage division and boycott. They reject the religious. Israelis went to the poll for the second time in six months in September after Netanyahu failed to pull together a government of a majority of Knesset members. According to the law, President Rivlin has three days to decide if he'll give the mandate to Gantz, who would then have 28 days to try to form a unity government. It's the first time since Netanyahu was elected in 2009 that another leader could be asked to form a government, though Gantz's chances of succeeding are slimmer. Blue and White released a statement saying, Blue and White is determined to create the liberal unity government led by Gantz that the people elected a month ago. Gantz has less backers than Netanyahu, but could also try to build a minority government that would be supported from the outside by the Arab parties who deny Israel's right to exist. Netanyahu warned against this. If Gantz takes up the challenge to form a new government and fails after 28 days, there's another option. If any Knesset member can bring together a majority of Knesset members, they could become the next prime minister. If that fails, Israelis will head to new elections, probably next March. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Well, in other news, the president says he might leave some troops in Syria to protect, guess what, the Kirkuk oil fields that we've been talking about on this program on and on and on. But some members of Congress want him to do more. John Jessup has that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. Thanks, Pat. The Turkish and Russian presidents met today in the Black Sea resort town of Sochi. Their talks are crucial in extending a ceasefire set to expire today and as Syrian Kurds fear the Turkish slaughter may resume. Gary Lane has the story. With the ceasefire set to end later today, there's concern the Turks will restart their onslaught against the Kurds. As U.S. troops continue their pullout, there's word that a small force might remain. When Vladimir Putin met with Turkey President Erdogan Tuesday, the Russian president said Turkey had violated Syrian sovereignty. The U.S. troops were seen leaving northeastern Syria and heading to Iraq on Monday. They were bid farewell by angry Kurds who threw potatoes at them. Some held signs thanking the American people, but saying that, quote, Trump betrayed us. They might not be welcome in Iraq either, as that government says there's no agreement for them to stay there. Appearing on the Fox News show Hannity, the president said a ceasefire agreement would not have been reached without two and a half days of fighting. It's like two kids in a playground. They fight. You let them fight for a minute, and then you pull them apart. It was much easier to make a deal. President Trump suggests he does not regret his decision to withdraw American troops from Syria. We have a good relationship with the Kurds. 
But we never agreed to, you know, protect the Kurds. We fought with them for three and a half to four years. We never agreed to protect the Kurds for the rest of their lives. And at the start of his cabinet meeting Monday, Mr. Trump said some residual American troops, maybe 200 or so, would remain inside Syria to protect Israel and Jordan in southern Syria and oil fields in the east. But Secretary of State Mike Pompeo says the U.S. is ready to use military action in the region if necessary. Some fighting continued despite the ceasefire. CBN News contributing correspondent Chuck Holton came under fire inside Syria as he and medics of the Free Burma Rangers rescued wounded Kurds. We've been moving down the road into territory that's held by the Free Syrian Army. As, right now, an hour ago, they shot at us with three machine guns and we had to flee and then now we're close. We're going right back. Under terms of the ceasefire, the Kurds have agreed to leave a safe zone south of the Turkish border. President Erdogan says only 800 Kurdish fighters have left the area. 1,300 remain. Turkey has warned Kurdish militias must honor the agreement. If they don't withdraw, our operation will restart. The challenge now is reaching a permanent deal. Since the Turkish military offensive, Operation Peace Spring began October 9th, more than 150,000 people have fled the fighting in northern Syria. Hundreds if not thousands have been killed or injured. CBN's Operation Blessing is helping many of the internally displaced inside northeast Syria. And more than 10,000 refugees have now crossed into Iraqi Kurdistan. OB is partnering with the Barzani Charitable Trust Foundation to provide hot meals to people in two camps there. And the German defense minister today suggested the security zone in northern Syria be controlled by the international community, including Russia and Turkey. Gary Lane, CBN News. Thanks, Gary. Pat? Well, we're giving back what has taken years and years to build up. We had control of that area. Now the Russians are coming in. The Turks are coming in. We've lost control of it. And it's a humanitarian disaster. And uh, that's just the way it is. But uh, given that uh, reality, we're at CBN are working with the uh, Barzani Charitable Foundation to uh, provide meals and necessary help to these Kurdish and Christian refugees who are being forced to flee because of this bitter fighting. And we're, we're giving, uh, well, you, we have clean water, we have blankets, we have uh, hot meals, we have the things that they need so badly. And uh, we need much more help. And if you want to be participating in that, it's CBN Operation Blessing Disaster Relief Fund. CBN Center, and that's the number to call, 1-800-700-7000. We want to do everything we can to stand with those brave people, even though they may have well been betrayed by our nation. John. Pat, pro-life advocates decry the hundreds of thousands of abortions performed in America every year, but the tragedy doesn't stop there. Intact parts of the child's body are in high demand among scientists, and as Jennifer Wishon explains in this alarming report, you may need to sit down when you hear who's paying for their experiments. Organs, bones, and other body parts of aborted babies are being sold and transplanted into lab animals. No, this is not a passage out of Frankenstein. These are real experiments happening now that taxpayers are funding. It's abhorrent on so many levels. Anthony Bellotti is president and founder of White Coat Waste Project, a group exposing experiments like this. Here are the reproductive tracts from aborted 13-week-old twin girls were stripped out and implanted into mice. Last year, the National Institutes of Health funded 200 similar studies across 50 institutions, mostly universities, in 33 states. This year, the NIH estimates it will spend 120 million tax dollars on research using aborted baby parts. But this is a crisis now. This problem is growing in spite of Republicans, Democrats, pro-lifers, animal advocates. Nobody wants this. Teresa Bukovinak runs Pro-Life San Francisco. The bulk of the research happens in her backyard at the University of California, San Francisco. 
One of the most um, infamous projects that was recently canceled by the Trump administration was um, a project that involved humanizing mice. And that project required two pristine, healthy fetuses between the ages of 18 and 24 weeks per month. Nearly 70 members of Congress from both parties are working to expose these gruesome experiments. They've issued a letter demanding information from Secretary of Health and Human Services, Alex Azar. You're asking him to indicate how many different babies were used in each project and the gestational ages of each. It, can you believe that you're even having to write a letter like this? It is deeply saddening to me that our own government would be a part of creating this marketplace for the buying and selling of baby parts. In June, the Trump administration took steps to end human fetal research, but loopholes allow most of it to continue. In response, more than 90 research institutions wrote Secretary Azar to say fetal tissue remains an essential resource, crediting it for vaccines and potential treatments for ALS, spinal cord injuries and Parkinson's disease. Opponents agree this is important research, but argue there are alternatives to human fetal tissue. Using it, they say, encourages late-term abortions, which produce more developed babies that are more lucrative when sold for research. That means abortion doctors receive incentives to use techniques that preserve babies and all their parts for science experiments. So the only two ways they can do these abortions is through a live dismemberment or a medical induction, which according to the Society of Family Planning is very likely to produce born alive infants. To our core, to our founding, the recognition of the importance of life is who we are and we can never get away from that. Legislation has been introduced here on Capitol Hill that would prohibit the Secretary of Health and Human Services from authorizing any research that uses aborted baby parts. Research on stillbirth or miscarriage tissue would still be allowed. Jennifer Wish on CBN News, Capitol Hill. Thank you, Jennifer. Pat, I'm sure a lot of people will be shocked when they learn about these experiments. Well, they're no more shocked than I am. Ladies and gentlemen, can you imagine our government funding a human mouse uh, experiment, baby parts, aborted $120 million being spent with your money. I mean, this is monstrous. This is something out of the nightmare. I mean, even Adolf Hitler didn't do anything as bad as this. This is horrible. Even having had that vote come from the White House against it, yeah. it still exists. Well, they, it make, they, you know, it's like something well, that will not well, lay he, down and die. It's just a, a, an absolute nightmare, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, you can write your congressman and say, look, I, I just don't think as the United States government, uh, we shouldn't be spending taxpayer money. It isn't just that it's, they're encouraging late-term abortions and paying doctors for baby parts, but that they're marrying and trying to make a mouse human, a human mouse. I mean, this is, this is horrible. I mean, I, I don't know what to say, except whatever you do, write your congressman, call your congressman so you can't stand something like this. Well, we've got a lovely thing. Before we get on, I just want to say you have been very busy these days. I have days. been busy, Terry. <laughs> I have finished book number 21. Successful Families and Finance in the Kingdom. I finished it uh, yesterday, and I, my other work is called I've, I've Walked with the Living God. It's a major work, and both of them are going to be coming out very shortly. But uh, yesterday, I, I, after great uh, struggle, I finished uh, it's about 100 pages of uh, Successful Families and Finances. Well, you rolled from one right into the other. Well, so. it, it's, you're kind of in a zone. It's, it's the most amazing thing. But... Uh, well, what I've seen in my books is just nothing in compared to our next guest. So that you want to is tell the truth. Right. Coming up later, she has sold more than 200 million books. So can you believe her third grade teacher said she'd never amount to anything? Debbie Maycumber reveals how a trip to the yarn shop changed her life forever. But first, a life or death fight, an Iraqi man in a high stakes battle to keep his family in the United States. And if he fails, his son could die. So why is their government demanding they go back to Iraq? Find out after this. Caught in a trap, an Iraqi family living in the United States 
must choose between letting their two-year-old son die or obeying their government's demands. Why are they in such a desperate dilemma? Eric Phillips reports on the gut-wrenching decision these young parents face. The journey for this family began in Iraq where the government helped make it possible for them to come to America. Now, Iraq wants them home, and that's literally creating a life or death decision. At first glance, John Boutros appears like a healthy, energetic two-year-old. Sadly, there's much more to this toddler than immediately meets the eye. The most difficult part for me, seeing my child suffering as a mom. And I cannot imagine losing him. It's, it's very difficult. And it makes the entire family's situation difficult as well. In 2013, we saw Toma and his wife, both Christians, left Iraq for him to attend Virginia Commonwealth University and earn a PhD in pharmacology and toxicology. During that time, the couple had two children, Miriam and John. The family celebrated at Wissam's graduation in 2018. Behind the smiles, however, was worry. It's very difficult and very frustrating, very stressful too. The stressful situation began with their son, John. He was fine, he was happy, nothing was wrong with him when he was born. Then, at only six months old, John contracted a viral infection. Although it went away after a couple of months, it left him not wanting to eat. Doctors eventually discovered painful ulcers and fluid going to John's lungs. As he began to lose weight, doctors inserted a feeding tube. He was not comfortable at all. He was sad, congested all of the time from that tube. He'll, he'll sneeze, the tube will come out, and we, we have to put it back. It was a very kind of painful process. Sometimes blood will come out of his nose. He'll choke. Then came unexplained seizures, kidney stones, and abnormal growth. Doctors ran all kinds of tests looking for answers. Finally, in July, the family got a diagnosis from doctors here at the Children's Hospital of Richmond at VCU that answered some questions, but perhaps created even more. John was diagnosed with a genetic disorder. It's called Nicolaitis Baretzer syndrome. It's very rare. I have never seen a case with it or 75 cases in the world. He needs a number of physicians to work with him, neurology, kidney, uh, doctors, um, feeding and developmental specialists that we have here at Children's Hospital of Richmond. Go, ben. Treatment that John certainly would not get back in Iraq, although that doesn't concern government officials there. They want Wissam back because he signed a government contract to receive the scholarship. The agreement is if the student doesn't come back home, he's required to pay back uh, all his uh, due uh, in a, on a lump sum. And that totals more than $300,000, money the family does not have. Wissam's offered to pay back the loan and installments, but Iraq says no. He's reached out to both the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad and the Iraqi Embassy in Washington. Neither can help due to the binding document. What's worse, Wissam's siblings co-signed the contract, and now the government is garnishing their pay. They say, uh, I know you are trying your best to help that, but you have to come back. His family back home is in a situation because of us, and we care about them too, but we had no choice in this situation also. Nobody wished to have a sick child. After being turned down for a loan, the family started a GoFundMe account online, but have only raised a fraction of what they need. As Christians, we always hold our cross and walk everywhere, like in the Psalm. 23rd, even if I walk in the valley of shadow of death, yeah, I shall feel no evil because you are with me. So it's, this is our life there. We accept everything, but now the other, the, the major issue of us is John's health. What do you want to see happen? A miracle. Yes. We have faith in God, we believe in God, and we believe in miracles. The family believes there's an answer to their situation, but so far they haven't found it. They're hoping that by getting their story out, someone may have a suggestion that will point them in the right direction. In the meantime, they're feeling the weight of the world on their shoulders. In Washington, Eric Phillips, CBN News. Well, the tragedies that take place in our lives and 
I don't know what will happen, but uh, I'm sure people will see that and maybe want to help them. I mean, yes. it's not a whole lot of money. I mean, $300,000 is, is to them. Not if a lot of people came together. That you know, could it would be done in a matter of, of uh, minutes. So in any event, uh, we, we have information at CBN that maybe if you want to help these people, so-called crowdfunding, they can do, take care of it. All right, Ted. Well, up next, Debbie Maycumber's desperate pay prayer, Just Let Me Publish One Book. <laughs> How that prayer was answered 150 times over. And what's her secret to writing so many bestsellers? Plus, straight from our inbox, Stephanie wants to know, is it a sin to decide not to have children in a marriage? Get ready for another round of your questions and some honest answers. That's all coming up. Nineteen eighty two, the year Debbie Maycomer's first book was published. A whopping one hundred and fifty more have followed, making her one of the most prolific authors in our country today. Success has not come easy. Debbie had to overcome a long list of rejections and, hard to believe, a diagnosis of dyslexia. Well, here's how she did it. I can remember just praying, oh Lord, just let me publish one book, just one book. It's been almost 50 years since best-selling author Debbie Maycomer uttered that prayer. Over 150 books later, Millions have turned to her work for stories of love, loss, and hope. I was making up stories when I was four years old. You know, I, I, this is the gift God gave me. He gave me this in creative imagination. Even then, it was unlikely this bright girl from Yakima, Washington, would ever become a best-selling author. Debbie was dyslexic. The third grade teacher told my mother, Debbie's a nice little girl, but she's never going to do well. I struggled so hard in school, and I had few friends. But a trip with her mother to the yarn store and a knitting class turned her life around. In learning to knit, I learned comprehension skills, math skills. It gave me such a badly needed feeling of accomplishment and self-esteem. It would do more than boost her confidence. Those skills would help Debbie overcome her dyslexia. And by fifth grade, she was reading as well as anyone her age. And I started my first book just about the time I learned to read. I've always loved story. And you know, that's what Jesus did. He taught in stories. And I, you know, he's given me this gift and I have used it to tell stories that hope with of reaching others for him in a, in a subtle and gentle way. Married at 19 to Wayne, Debbie raised four children while trying to fit in as much writing as possible. After years of rejection letters, Debbie picked up freelance magazine work, but she never left her dream of being a published novelist. When you want something so badly, you know, you have to be willing to face rejection. Finally, in 1982, 33-year-old Debbie had her first book published, Heart Song. So for a long time, I felt like I was taking something away from our family. But in retrospect, I was teaching our children some of the most valuable lessons of their lives. You know, about the power of a dream, about believing in yourself, about standing up against rejection. You know, those are all really powerful lessons that they all learned. Since then, 13 of Debbie's novels have reached number one on the New York Times bestsellers list, and six were made into hit movies on the Hallmark Channel, including the ever-popular Cedar Cove series. First of all, the story has to be relevant to my reader. It has to be provocative, because I want the reader to think. It has to be told in the most realistic way I can think to tell it, and that includes conflict. And it has to be done creatively, and it has to be entertaining. I'm not here to teach anybody anything. I ask God to give me the ideas. Every single book has been prayed over. For inspiration, Debbie often pulls from her real-life experiences when developing story ideas. Every aspect of my life has been explored in one way or another. I mean, when the kids were little, it was all about raising kids. And, you know, now that I'm a, a mature adult, 
<laughs> you know, it's more, it's harder for me to write about a 25 year old falling in love. It's, it's more about relationships and things about real life, like losing your family or starting over again. She believes it's those relatable stories of love, loss, and hope that have earned her so many loyal fans. The only way I can think to explain it is like a spiritual connection, because I know if I laugh when I'm writing a scene, the reader will laugh. If I cry, they'll cry. If I lay my heart out on the page, it links with theirs. And they feel like the many letters I get, they feel like they know me, and they do because they have read my words. The success and accolades aside, Debbie hopes her words will lead others to another bestseller. One of the, the best uh, letters I ever got from a reader, I said, I started reading your books and now I'm reading my Bible. At 70 years old, she's in no hurry to retire. In fact, she just released another novel, Window on the Bay, and another is right behind it, A Mrs. Miracle Christmas, and I've, I've tried to slow down. The hardest part for me in my life right now is balance. I just want to write, you know, I have, if I don't write, I get cranky. And with God's help, write she will. I'm happiest when I'm writing. I mean, I really love what I do. You know, there's that verse in scripture for in Ephesians that said, God will do above and beyond anything you can think or imagine. I'm just leaving it up to him. She is one of the most delightful people we've ever had on the show. Isn't I she think. amazing? I mean, so <laughs> unbelievable. Really but, uh, incredibly yeah. humble, incredibly yeah. gifted. Amen. Well, it's time for some email questions. Are uh, you let's ready? Let's go for it. Okay. The first one comes from Stephanie Pat, who says, Is it a sin to decide not to have children in a marriage? Oh, uh, I, I'll answer that by, by giving you a biblical scripture. God talked to the first humans and said, quote, be fruitful and multiply and possess the earth and subdue it. And uh, the Bible also says God seeks godly uh, offspring. And I, I think to say we are not going to use the, the gifts God's given us, the DNA that God's put in our hands to bring forth children, I think it's selfish and I think it's, uh, is it a sin? I, I think it's wrong. I think if you don't want to get married, that's your business. But if you do get married, the Bible says, you know, you know, children are a gift of the Lord, and and uh, happy is the man whose quiver is full of them. You go through the Bible, and, and this is a marvelous gift of God, and you're saying you want me to frustrate that gift? I, I, I don't agree with that. Okay. This is Donna, who says, how important is it to fast? I don't hear about very many doing it. Personally, I find it difficult to do. Well, there are a lot of fasts. There, there's a no pleasant bread where, where you don't eat uh, uh, dessert. Uh, you can fast for a particular uh, beverage or something that you can fast from uh, watching TV. A lot of things you can fast from as well as not eating. Uh, but uh, uh, it's, you know, the Bible says, I afflicted my soul with fasting, that somehow you, you afflict yourself and then it gets you closer to the Lord because you're not thinking about the next meal, you're thinking about Jesus. But uh, to some people, it's almost impossible. They have medical conditions, they can't do it. Mm -hmm. I don't know what to say, but... Uh, do you do it very often? I used to do a lot. Uh, I haven't recently because I've had, you know, some mm -hmm. medical problems myself. And But I used to, I, I fasted every Friday. and. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, with with Bill Bright, he was he was big on those forty day fasts, one after the other. I just didn't think it was all that that important. But uh, uh, okay. This is Miriam who says, Pat. In the past two years, I've lost all my siblings. I am the youngest of seven kids. Is God punishing me? Why did God take everyone away from me? Oh, uh, just say right now, why did God take them away? Uh, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints. And I, I think he didn't take them away. If they knew Jesus, they were they, they in paradise with the Lord, rejoicing forever. And, uh, you know, the righteous perish, and no man takes it to heart, not knowing that they're being spared from the evil to come. So God hasn't punished anybody. And I think what you ought to do is just rejoice the fact that your siblings are with the Lord, and uh, one day you'll be there with them. All right. 
This is Robin who says, I'm torn about preventive medicine. Before I accepted Christ, I regularly went in for routine checkups. I now feel I'm putting this in God's hands. My thought is that a bad diagnosis would do nothing but send me into a spiritual panic. I trust God, but haven't found an answer to this dilemma. What are your thoughts? Well, my thoughts is that I am a fan of uh, modern medicine. Uh, at Regent University, we have a school of medicine. We teach nursing and all these other things. I think that uh, uh, medicine is a gift that uh, has been given to mankind. I think if you trust only in doctors, you're making a mistake. You know, what was the great thing that the doctor said, you know, we bind the wound, but God is the one who heals. Mm -hmm. And I think the healing comes from the Lord. Uh, but uh, the idea of, of using medicine. There's so many techniques that are being used. I mean, I, I keep laughing. I'm like an old car with parts. I've got, I've got a pacemaker <laughs> in my chest. I've got a titanium knee. I've got all, you know. There's a bionic uh, bag. I've had all sorts of things. And, and I'm, I'm living, I've outlived all of my, uh, my, my mother, my father, and my brother by considerable amounts. And I think uh, I'm delighted with medicine. So. I'm, I'm not anti-medicine, and I don't think the Bible is either. All right. This is Alex who says, should we repent for our sins we commit, or are we already forgiven for our sins we commit today and in the near future? John Wesley said, there's not a day that goes by that I don't plead the blood of Jesus. I think every day, uh, you know, we, we, the idea is to keep short accounts with God. If you have sinned, you go before the Lord and say, I ask your forgiveness. Do not, do not let sin fall up, uh, build up in your life. Because if you do, your heart will get hardened and you'll get, you know, uh, your sins have separated you from God. So I, I don't think you can say, well, all right, God's, he died and that took care of my sins for the rest of my life. It just doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. all right. This is uh, Linda who says this week on a TV game show, one of the questions was, quote, the 1796 Treaty of Tripoli, the government of the United States is not in any sense founded on this religion. The answer was Christianity. This flies in my face about everything I've been taught and believe. Can you explain this? Well, if you look at the Constitution of every one of our 50 states, there's not one that doesn't mention a supreme being. So, every single constitution of every single state and uh, you know, the Declaration of Independence says that our liberties are given us by God. And uh, so we are, I remember Guzorek versus Clausen is one case where Justice Powell said, we are religious people whose institution presupposed the existence of a supreme being. Um, and I, I think without question, uh, the, the Supreme Court did rule in the trustees, uh, I forget the name of the, the trustees case, that we are a Christian nation. Mm -hmm. So uh, this thing, we, we were being attacked by those pirates out of Tripoli, and we sent Marines over there, you know, from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. Yes. They went over there and beat up on those guys to keep those Barbary pirates from attacking our ships. And whatever treaty was made, I, I think without question, the Christian religion has been the foundation of our nation. All right. Okay, this is Ed who says, Matthew 6.33 says to seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. Besides reading the word and prayer, is there more we could be doing to accomplish this? Good heavens, yes. Uh, seek first the kingdom of God. How are you going to live for him? There's so many things that you can do to please God. Not only prayer and Bible reading, but uh, assembling of yourselves together, witnessing for him, doing acts of kindness. You can go on and on and on. But more than anything, uh, you know, what is the great commandment? You love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Well, there's a lot in comfort to that. So you seek God. That's what seeking the Lord. And you seek God, and then these other things will be added. So the idea is you don't seek money. You don't seek fame. You don't seek success. You don't seek victory. You seek God. Lord, let me, my wife, please you, tell me what you want me to do today. As each day goes by, God, tell me what you want me to do. And that is seeking him. And when you do that, this other stuff will come along and be given unto you. That's what the Bible says.
Thank you for those questions. Thank you. Good answer. Good answers. Okay. Well, still ahead, staring down bankruptcy. Their biggest client canceled and revenue slashed in half. How did this couple save their company? Then later, she had holes throughout her brain, bizarre behavior, and a diagnosis of dementia. How in the world did she make a complete recovery? That's coming up. Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News Break. Christian believers were forcibly removed from a government approved church in China just minutes before it was demolished. The Religious Liberty magazine Bitter Winter reports China's communist government suddenly marked it as illegal, adding that more than a thousand security officers carried out the raid on the True Jesus Church in the Henan province. Two elderly church members were injured and taken to the hospital. While Christians around the world are calling on the government of Malaysia to explain the disappearance of a church leader missing for more than two years. Pastor Raymond Koh had been threatened for Christian activities in the Muslim nation. Malaysia's Human Rights Commission says Pastor Koh was taken into custody by a special branch of the police. The Voice of the Martyr says this security video shows three black SUVs surrounding Coe's vehicle the day he disappeared, his car forced to a stop, and a team surrounding the car before they all drive away. Pastor Coe's family doesn't know if he's still alive. The Voice of the Martyrs launched a petition drive to press Malaysia's government for an explanation. Find out how you can sign that petition and get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Pat and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Ann and Ellen Shack were successful entrepreneurs. Then their biggest client lowered the boom and left them, wiping out 50% of their revenue. The Shacks could have panicked. Instead, they made a daring move that got their business back on track. CBN partners Ed and Alan Shack unwind from work by walking along the Jersey Shore. Together, they built a successful cosmetic supply company. It's really awesome to run a company with your spouse because his strengths are my weaknesses and vice versa, and we can complement each other so well. We actually sell our ingredients to the, the end users, the manufacturers, and they in turn make their own products and sell them to the consumer. Our business was growing, our staff was growing, and we were outgrowing the space we were in. They had just bought a bigger building when their biggest client called and ended their 14-year relationship. It was devastating to both Ellen and I. We could understand if the business was not doing well and the sales performance wasn't there, but uh, our staff and our team were doing really well nationally with them. With a higher building cost and a near 50% cut in business, Ed and Ellen feared their company would go under. The first thing that I was struggling with is, we may have to lay off some people. Ed and Ellen prayed to God for help. I just felt a sense of peace that the Lord was involved and that he was going to take care of it. The Shacks also resolved that no matter what, they were going to remain consistent in giving. There was not going to be any changes in our tithing, in our giving. I didn't see our tithing and our maintaining our giving as a way out. I knew that the Lord was going to support us. Shortly after that prayer, the Shacks landed a new client, a deal that restored more than half of their losses. It was absolutely amazing, but it was, it was proof to Ellen and I that the Lord was working through the process. And it's been amazing. We've always have known that He has us, He has our back, that He has our business. On the advice of friends, the Shacks used their extra building space to start a new venture called the Urban Shack, which now gives local artisans a retail venue. It allows them to test and measure, you know, making a product and seeing if it's sellable. It now gave us that peace and comfort to move the business along, not have to worry about firing people. Now with their company back on track, the Shacks have confidence in God's plan for the business and their lives. And for over 30 years, Ed and Ellen have been partners with CBN. They've continued to entrust their finances to CBN and have even volunteered with our humanitarian outreaches. So one of the great things that we did with Operation Blessing was we became volunteers for Hurricane Sandy right down in this area, which was devastated, this part of New Jersey. We can't physically be there on the other side of this world, but we can support 
the, the work of Operation Blessing and CBN in building water wells. And it's just unimaginable to not have drinkable water. So everybody should have water. That just blesses our heart, knowing that we can take care of these small villages. So for us, we love the, the way that CBN uses our money and our resources, our gifts, to, uh, to bless other people. Aren't they wonderful people, the shacks? Love God, and they know that they can't go everywhere in the world. But what we're saying is in their name, or in the Lord's name, we can. And so CBN is reaching out to the world, and we've drilled, I don't know, I'm trying to think how many, 14,000 or say, more. thousands and thousands. Yeah, of thousands people. and thousands of wells that bring clean water to hundreds of millions of people and then orphans promise you go down the line. Wonderful things that are being done. And uh, people like the Shacks, they are our partners and our friends, and we love them and thank God for them. If you want to be a partner, and we wish you would, it's, it's so easy. Uh, you can just pick up the phone, call in, so you can count on me. I want to be a 700 Club member. That's $20 a month. That's 65 cents a day. That's all it is. And you can be a 700 Club member. And, or you can go more. You can be a 1,000 Club member or a member of the Chairman's Circle. But whatever, I want to send you something called the Transforming Word. These are wisdom, favor, and anointing, the things I've asked God for over the years. And these are Proverbs that highlight wisdom, favor, and anointing. So we'll give this to you as our gift when you join. So pick up the phone and call in. I want to be like those wonderful people, the shacks I just heard about. And you can be a partner if you would. Please call 1-800-700-7000. Terry. Well, up next, it would be best if she died quickly. That's what doctors said after taking a look at this woman's CAT scan. Plus, no hope of recovery. So why is she now alive and well? The answer right after this. A far away look in her eyes, extreme fits of rage, no inhibitions or boundaries. Peggy King's behavior became more and more bizarre, alarming her husband and children. Still, no one in the family was prepared for her shocking diagnosis. Duane and Peggy King had a full and happy life. Married since 1961, They've spent most of their time traveling and sharing the gospel as the founders of Deaf Missions. But in early 2010, Duane noticed that something seemed off with Peggy. The terrible, terrible faraway look in her eyes and the actions were just awful. He would tell me that she had some extreme fits of rage if she didn't get her way, and that was not like my mom at all. She's one of the sweetest ladies on the planet. She just didn't have the same kind of inhibitions and boundaries. We just gradually became more and more concerned. Eventually, doctors diagnosed Peggy with FTD, frontotemporal dementia. An MRI revealed her frontal lobe had shrunk, and there were holes throughout her brain. She'll do nothing but get worse. Another professional said, the best thing you can do is pray she dies quickly. That friction between the two of them during that time was very, very difficult for him. She would uh, run away. She'd keep me awake. I couldn't sleep. Finally, we uh, put her head in the memory ward, made her at home best we could when we left. <laughs> when we left, and that door locked. That was awful. I remember feeling like I was losing my mom, but then as my dad's concerns about her grew, I remember feeling like I was losing him too. With the prognosis from the medical community of no hope of recovery, Peggy's family reached out to other relatives and friends for prayer. Prayers for her healing, 
prayers of comfort for my dad, prayers of comfort for us. The number of people praying for her because of the connections that my parents have had through their ministry through the years. And especially with, with social media today, word gets out. Why would we not expect a miracle? I was praying, Lord, help me accept this. And there was a day when I remember distinctly, God, do you take this? It's more than I can handle. That very day is the same day that Peggy, in the memory ward, was giving up to God. And from that moment on, she started to get better. When you kneel to pray. Since that day, not only did Dwayne notice a difference in Peggy's cognition, behavior, and motor skills, so did the doctors. So much so that by Christmas of that same year, the doctors and staff of the memory unit agreed that Peggy was well enough to be discharged and sent home. And she did so well, she started cooking. She could follow a recipe. She could play the piano. That terrible, far away look was gone from her eyes. Then the doctor said, I have treated hundreds of patients and it, nobody ever got better. This is a miracle. Though a CAT scan shows Peggy still has an abnormal brain, her condition has never regressed and she has never had to return to the memory unit. Her family says they owe it all to God and the power of prayer. And at first I thought, you know, I was scared I'd go back, but it's just good and maybe a little better all the time. That's more of a miracle that God is letting me function normally with an abnormal Hi, brain. Peggy. God is good and wonderful. I don't understand it all, but I think it's very evident that through men and women of faith and men, men and women of prayer, um, powerful things happen. We have had her back. We have had her the matriarch of our family again. How could we ever not thank God that we get to have our mom cooking? <laughs> we have so many friends and so many prayers, and most of the people were praying for her to be better, to be well. To have her back is a great blessing, a great, great blessing. An extraordinary miracle. Peggy's brain did not change, but Peggy changed because God performed a miracle in her spirit life. Spirit came into that body and it just didn't work. I mean, it's amazing. just amazing. All right, we have some, um, here's somebody named Linda who lives in Virginia Beach. She had a urinary tract infection, UTI. And when you have those, it can lead to psychosis of various natures. All kinds of things, yeah. Well, she was watching this program. Terry had a word. A woman with recurring UTI infection, God's healing you. Not just the one you have now, but you have not will have them anymore. And the doctor said, God gets the glory. Okay, wow. she's healed. Well, this is Alma, Pat. She lives in Staten Island, New York. She suffered from a ruptured intestine for Ooh. eight months. Then one day she heard this word of knowledge prayed by you on this program. Something is going on with your intestine. God has blessed you and healed you. It will feel like a fire going through your body. Alma quickly claimed it by faith and said, oh my God, that's me and thank you, Lord. She had a sonogram done not long after her doctor found absolutely nothing wrong with her intestine. You know, I want to confess, I don't know Alan. I lived on Staten Island for a little while, but I do not know Alma. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know anything about her intestine. But God knows. God knows. God knows who you are. Now, we've got just a few moments to pray. Terry and I are going to join hands together. Please pray with us. God's going to do something for you. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for the power of God. We thank you for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Somebody else says, you've got a ruptured appendix. God just, it's been very painful and, and it's dangerous. God has just touched you and, and the infection will go away and Jesus has done a miracle. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. The same for someone. You have ocular cancer and your diagnosis has not been positive uh, for the future. God is healing that condition for you. Literally, your eyes are going to be healed right now in Jesus' name. 
Uh, somebody under your tongue, there is something going on. There's some uh, lesions or sores. And just put your hand over your mouth in the name of Jesus. Touch. Terry. Is someone else recurring ulcers in your stomach so painful and just interrupting your ability to eat, Thank to digest you. foods? Be healed right now in Jesus' name. Stomach be returned to your normal condition. And Lord, we pray for Israel. We pray for this nation of ours. We pray for the stuff that's going on in our country. Lord, may we be one, even as you are one with the Father. Let there be unity. In the name of Jesus, mm -hmm. bring blessing. Thank you, Lord. Amen, amen and amen. Well, today's Power Minute is from Psalm 30. Oh, my God, I cried out to you, and you healed me. Tomorrow, we've got Fox News' Greg Jarrett drops the bomb still. He says, the Russian hoax is the greatest witch hunt in American history. It's an amazing book, and he'll be here to talk about uh, some of the things that perhaps you haven't seen. I think it'll be interesting. So for Terry and all of us, Pat Robertson, see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.